What a treat we have for y'all today. Welcome or welcome back to the It Bees Like That podcast. As always, I'm your host, Chris. Today, we have a special guest in the building. That's my siren, like in the NBA. Like before they shoot, before they yeah. start playing. Yeah. I love it. Uh, So we talked about it a couple of times about getting you on the podcast uh, today, finally making it happen, like an official episode. So I had an idea that we would share a bit about our individual experiences with the dependency process. For those of y'all who do not know what the dependency process is, that mm-hmm. means uh, we were impacted by the family court system and had to work to repair our lives and get our family back together. So with that being said, I want to preface this by saying, though we did this journey together, together forever. Okay. Um, we had distinctly different experiences for most of the time, right? So the way that you were received and treated by the professionals and people on our side of the table, as well as people on the other side of the table was most of the time, a pretty significant departure from the way that I was received and treated by both sides of the table. So I want to open up the mic or floor for you first and maybe ask a question. What was it um, that struck you? I mean, you can share whatever you want about your experience with your dependency process, but um, I'm curious how comfortable you'd be letting people know oh 45 of the viewers out there in (laughs) youtube land um what stood out to you the most and the differences between um just the baseline level of treatment that you observe between yourself and me and then if you want to just expand on um some of the larger takeaways from uh the process that you remember okay um So to start off, um, there was an initial call in the beginning, um, an investigative, they call it an intake, and um, that was being investigated. Mm-hmm. And this was before the kids were removed. We so can put still... that out there. We can put that out there. It's good to start from the beginning. I'm the one that made that call. Yeah. The first <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean in hindsight it was it was a cry for help which you know they didn't give us but um but i don't know if that was this anyway they um investigated me and um because i had the kids with me and i had moved out i mean we were using it was a mm-hmm. mess yeah, it was a mess so um I had moved out and moved into this other rental at the time. And um, they wanted me to take a UA, which I. Well, we know how to study for that shit now. I faked. I got my my friend's kids pee. (laughs) Yeah, it's pretty disgusting. But anyway, um, so got that investigation closed. And, you know, with the with a safety plan of <clears throat> leave the guy he's you know an abuser he's right you know he's making all these allegations he's unsafe um and at the time i was still in my disease and i was like yeah super right. unsafe <laughs> so um and then that one closed and then another intake came in and um that was the one where we were not there to pick up the kids mm. and i don't really remember what happened with that one um yeah, again, in my addiction. And then when the final one, when the kids removed, um, yeah. So going from that point forward, um, I mean, it was different from the get-go because of that first intake that I talked about, mm-hmm. um, where you were the big bad wolf and, you know, you were the abuser and, you know, you were um, an aggressive black man. Mm-hmm. Um, they never said though, I mean, they did say aggressive, they did say abuser, they didn't say the black man part, mm-hmm. but I mean, it was implied. And um, the interesting part was though, is that our social worker was also African-American and she- On the outside. On the outside. Keep it real. Yeah, but, <laughs> but she had more of a bias towards you than I feel anyone else in yeah. the, our entire case. And she, admit, she admitted it to me. Basically, she said, you know, I was just like you. I was in a relationship just like you. Mm-hmm. Um, 
you need to get away. Uh, he was abusive and gaslit me all the time. And I was like, in my head, I was like, this is not professional and you shouldn't be sharing this with me. Right. Um, and that was just kind of the, how the tone was set for our, for the most, for the majority of our case. Um, so can, I just want to pause for one second. Yeah. Remember where you, where you left off. Mm -hmm. So to highlight and this again, I guess is just the activist spirit of me. So I've had that in other situations pointed out. There's a, there's a common assumption, mostly by white people. And this isn't a call for you to come forward, but just a general statement um, that all skin folk or kin folk, meaning like all black people have this connection because this inherent connection because we're black. And they don't understand that. Well, a lot of people don't understand because one, they've never heard of it. Two, they don't understand it. That lateral racism is almost as sinister and devious as traditional racism, overt racism. So I just want to kind of bookmark that. We can come back and talk about lateral racism later, but I just wanted to highlight that so people could get a better picture and idea of what that actually looks like for us. Well, I think it's more damaging even because white people, they see a black person doesn't like this black person, then that black person must be really bad. Really bad, right. You know? So it's more, right. it's way more damaging. Um, I don't know if anyone could follow that. <laughs> but, uh, um, <laughs> Look, if they can't, then it's all right. It's, it's okay. <laughs> so that was just kind of, like I said, the tone throughout our case. It was constantly, I was the victim. Um, you know, I might have had a drug problem, but that was, you know, not that big of a deal. I could mm. get, you know, I could take care of that and um, have a great life with me and my children. And, you know, and I didn't need to be with you. Um, they didn't so much as say that I needed to get a divorce to get my kids returned, but they did say, mm. I mean, they did say if you were, if it was just you, you could have your kids returned tomorrow. Right. And they said that more than once. And, um, and now we got a German Shepherd that's part brain dead. Thank you very much. Yeah, Nipsey. <laughs> um, just kidding, he's great. <laughs> um, he, yeah, so it was really hard for me. Like I was really conflicted because it would mess with my head so much because here I am wanting my babies, thinking mm. I'm a bad, you know, having all this guilt and shame anyway. And I was, you know, sober at this point and stuff. So I was really feeling things. And um and then dangling this carrot in front of me mm. and I'm feeling like even a bigger piece of shit because I'm not jumping at it. Right. You know, and, and you were my sounding board more than once that you're like, no, we can get through this together. And ultimately, I mean, that's what we wanted. Um, and you had to talk me off the ledge because, you know, I'd spiral out and and newly sober, you know, you got all these motions anyway. And sure. but um yeah, it's a shitty game that they play. Um, and and then and then when I decided, you know, that I was like, okay, I need to take accountability and responsibility. And so mm. then I, you know, come forward like with my whole truth, my whole, right. you know, what's really going on, how I was abusive. I was a liar, you know. Um, they didn't want to hear it. They didn't want to right. hear it. You know, they're like, oh. You I know, remember that. Like, they oh, thought that I coached there. you to say that. Yeah, yeah. Right. They're like, he's got so much power and control over her. You see, yeah. it. you know, she's afraid to even talk around him. And I'm like, dude, I cut this guy off all the time. I For still real. do. <laughs> you know, like, For real. That's what I was like, man. If, mo if people knew, like, really, like, the real dynamic, because, I mean, honestly, like, I do have in more intense parts of my personality, but they have to do with other things outside of, like, uh, our personal relationship right yeah like the like if we're like to be honest like you are probably the more intense person or personality i don't mean that in like like a, a like a derogatory way or like to like unfairly put like a label on you but i you're you're way more laid back now these days like we both are considerably especially being clean and sober five years and coming through a lot of the stuff that we did together i think that kind of tempered us in yeah. a good way um kind of just like got those deburred us and got some of those rough edges off but um i in in a lot of ways in the like i'm the ice and you're the fire right 
<laughs> yeah. People that, but you know, on the outside, I don't think they think that. No. Out, no. you know, like in our little world, that's right. One thousand percent accurate. But yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But I mean, I think that, I mean, it works for us. It, it works well for us because in situations where I need a push or where I'm being <clears throat> challenged by my internal mechanisms, right? The, like my internal dialogue that's causing me self-doubt or whatever, then I always know that I can count on you to be there to kind of give me that push and like that call to like, essentially, don't be a sissy. Like you're stronger than this. Like you're tougher than this. Don't be a bitch. Get your bitch ass up. No. Um, <laughs> And then vice versa, like when you talked about or you shared about the the few times <clears throat> during the process, the dependency process where they the system does this thing that it's not it wasn't specifically designed for us. So I don't want anyone to make that mistake or misunderstand that. But it's a system that's efficient and it works with a lot of people, especially people who are coming out of desperation or newly sober have had their family disrupted, the kids removed, or even if they're in home care, you still have all these other people mucking around in your life and, you know, highlighting all these deficiencies Then you need to address and grow and it needs to happen now. And there's a timeline and all this different pressure from different places, but um, it works. So they do this bait and bash. Um, so circling back to like the, <clears throat> how our dispositions kind of even each other out in those times yeah you're right like and i to be honest and i think we, i've shared this with you before there were like not the first time but the second time when they really like pulled out the stops and they really like because they figured out like your more sensitive emotional triggers and they really played on those that time like i was <laughs> i got a little scared i didn't show it but i was like oh shit i feel like they're really like they're really screwing with their head right now um but I just knew, like, in those moments that as scared as I was, I feel like you were probably three times more afraid because I've been through wild shit, like, in my family dynamics since as long as I can remember. Um, so not that I, like, am impervious to things like that affecting me, but I just, I had, <clears throat> I've developed an ability and like this foresight to know that like this is probably the most intense this is going to be in weeks or months from now this all these these the really big feelings are going to abate and like people are going to lose motivation because that's just what it does that's just what happens to people and so long as i can stay strong we can stay strong together and move through like this rockier part we'll come out and be all right on the other side maybe a little banged up but you know all in all yeah still be all right and we were we have been you know and i think from the outside and I, well i don't think i know from the outside people um witness our experience and i think that we both do you especially like in the beginning shared more freely about your experience with this stuff than i did i played mine a little bit closer to the chest but um i think i've, I've grown a little more comfortable sharing it now but i think that people sometimes make a mistake and they think it was easy um, in that we had found this like magic fountain of resolve and fortitude that, you know, made us impervious and invincible to all of these attempts and attacks. But if people understood and knew like how many times, like individually we cried together, we cried, wanted to like, not even, I'm not even going to lie, bro. Like there was, I'm like, fuck, man, this is never going to get better. Like, you know, you have those feelings of being super discouraged and wondering if you should give up and wondering if people will be better off, you know, wondering if all of these things are true that are being <clears throat> disseminated about you, like in the open um, for everybody and their mama to hear who cares to spend any time to listen. Um, yeah. But being on this side of it, and being fortunate enough now to um, be in positions to do the things that we do, I, I I will never say that it was worth it. What I do believe is that um, the lessons that I think still carry us in a lot of ways that mm -hmm. we brought out of that, not just from the, the family court stuff, but from addiction and all that other stuff, I think 
are probably the most valuable things that we can pass on to the kids too right because like i mean i tell you all the time but like today i think i'm the most i've ever been in love with you before and that feels amazing because like (laughs) i've never i've always sucked at relationships we talk about that shit too but i think that there's a there's a certain kind of bonding that happens through like extreme adversity that people go through. And I think that we're on the other side of that now and it's powerful and inspires me still every day. Um, What do you, what do you think was like for you? Cause I mean, other than like our social workers changing, cause that made a big difference. Yeah in the the flow of our case but what do you think for you was like the big turning point i mean you had resolve from the beginning but it it did get a rocky for you a couple times but when you really found that next gear and like kicked it in it was like s all right this is this is what it's gonna be i mean i don't know i think that there was a couple different moments i mean I think one was when I, you know, finally told my attorneys and social worker and everyone because I was scared to like tell them like, no, I want to do this together. We're doing this together. So stop with all the other noise. This is the plan, you know, and that took a lot of pressure off. Um, Maybe not at this moment. They're like, fine, fuck, God. Maybe not at that moment, but it did, you know. Yeah long term because then I wasn't getting all like these mixed messages and like all this other stress but and then you know I mean like we've talked about it before is like you know they set their bar and then we were up here you know like going back to school was huge for us getting an apartment Mm. was huge for us because we were homeless right um and I don't think a lot of people like know that like they're like you know like no we struggled we were homeless I mean you know like we didn't have shit right um yeah and it's i mean we everything we did was like on our own right i'm glad you brought that up because i talk about it um on my platforms where i share did various forms of content but i think i mean people whatever they receive me one of two ways they're either they're either stoked on it or they're just like they don't want to hear any of it but i share that with people like i tell people like look man uh, we had nothing. We had zero. We, we were counted out, done. People washed their hands of us, mm-hmm. like we like in a sleeping in cars and like scraping money together for hotels and all this shit and taking that wild ass trip over to what was it, Utah, Idaho? Uh, yeah, <laughs> over to Idaho and like all that. Like we lit with by a prayer, like even <laughs> like a whisper of a prayer. We made it. I don't know how the hell we made it over there, but. <laughs> God, God, <laughs> for real, <laughs> that's a different story. But like, yeah, I think we spent like three grand in a matter of eighteen hours. <laughs> like, like, yeah, just on the way back, spent all oh, that God. damn money. Uh, but no, like, I, again, I'm glad you brought that up because where we came from, that's one of the reasons why I hold such a strong position about I. And it's, it's, you really, people are really going to have to bring a solid argument against this to convince me to change my mind. But I'm talking about like, from as long ago as I can remember, I am that kid who grew up accessing community services. So I understand instability. I understand poverty. I understand summers without lights and heat and power and running water and, and like staying the night at different friends' houses because my dad wanted to make sure that I got at least two meals a day or having my one meal a day or two meals a day coming from school. But in summertime, it was slim pickings. And, you know, having grown up, you know, my dad addicted to crack and just all kinds of like being prostitutes around and domestic violence and just all kinds of wacko shit. So to move forward through being incarcerated through JRA and DOC and my experience with addiction to our experience with addiction to the dependency process and all of these things being homeless and da 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 I am not naive to the f- pain and agony and adversity that comes along with all of this shit because 
real shit. Like I've been experiencing degrees of it since I was a little boy. So I try my best to impart that wisdom onto people. But I, I think that a lot of it coming from me loses value because people look at me, they're like, Oh, well, duh, look at you. Like, of course, that's your story. Of course, that's your life story. Coming from somebody else, they may pay a bit more attention to it. You know what I mean? Because mm-hmm. I'm the only reason why I feel like I'm a novelty or I'm a unicorn is because most of the people that I grew up with are either dead or in prison, strung out on drugs, don't have their kids, or in one shape or another. Like, not all of them. Some of them did make it and have really good lives. But a lot of these dudes, I see them. Guys, I went to elementary school, like at the camp behind Walmart or camped out at my old work. Like they were like, hey, Chris, what's up? I'd be like, damn, bro, that's crazy. Like that could have been me. But mm-hmm. for certain sets of circumstances, JRA being one of them saved my life and exposed me to different things. Right. And then God knew what he was doing with the chaos and messiness um, and shutting one door and closing another and trapping me in one space and then moving me to another ultimately to put me here with you and our family and the mission that we're on now. And I feel extremely blessed, but going back to the original point, I, I do my best to get that across to people. But again, they, I think that from an outside perspective, they look at it and then one, of course, that's my story. And two, they don't hear it. Like it really doesn't resonate the pain of the experience to them. I think one, because I articulate it really well, in two because i don't know maybe they feel like i just have a higher tolerance for pain than the average human yeah. i don't think that's true i don't think that's true i mean i've been through a lot of it but um anyway so i did have a couple other questions um when so we're both in services and based on our experiences we have a uniquely qualified perspective, not that we're the only ones, but we have a uniquely qualified perspective to speak on issues like substance abuse, equity, um, addiction, dependency processes, because we went through the one successfully. Like we legitimately should write like a handbook on it and disseminate it because the things that we did during ours, I think that a lot of people could benefit from at least like the basic framework. Right. Um, So your approach to informing people is a bit different than mine. So when you go about informing people, what is on your mind? And then I'll share with you what's on my mind, because you seem to have a higher degree of patience and grace for people um, and offer them a bit more leeway when calling them forward and inviting them to be informed and accountable. When I work with my when I work with my parents, no, with other pro- like professional peers. Oh, oh, I don't know. I mean, part of it's just my personality. I mean, you know, like I've got that. I don't know, people pleaser type. You got that thing. riz, bruh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But um, <clears throat> I don't. I don't know. Talk about yours, and then maybe I'll you know, something so, will come to mind. <clears throat> I hear, so my approach, honestly, um, when I hear or when people say to me, because I'm not blind, I see and gauge the reactions that I get from people. Um, Here's my take on it. When they say I should inform people with care, I do. I do. And I'll tell you the difference and why I believe that I do, because I don't do any of the things that were done to me when I was being informed of the deficiencies about me. I don't insult people. I don't lie about people. I don't make up false narratives. I don't manipulate situations, emotions, and circumstances for personal agendas. I don't unfairly malign people. I don't gatekeep. I don't curate information. I'm a free giver of my time, charity, grace, and humility, wisdom, experience, and love. So just based on those metrics, I am on the opposite end of the spectrum of any of the expectations that people had for me or the treatment that people had for me when I was being informed of (laughs) the litany of deficiencies that were supposedly readily apparent that I was just oblivious to. So um, I don't, I don't suffer a lot of regret 
with my method or delivery. And I've shared this with you before, and I share this with other people. Of the things that I got from my dad, one of them was in growing up mixed race, black and Whatcom County, this is true my entire life. He said, you are not like other people. You're not like the other people that you live around. You need to remember that you're different and you will always be treated that way. You'll get subtle and overt reminders. Um, his language was a bit different, but <clears throat> I'm, <laughs> I'm translating it from the way that he related to me. Um, but overall, the point was you are wasting your time and you will build for yourself more grief and strife in your mind, spirit, Damn it, we're almost out of time. Um, we can log back in, but anyway. Um, if you don't speak directly to people what is on your mind, you can do that without being rude. People think that, that it's rude when you speak directly to them about an issue. <laughs> and one thing that I hope that people will understand ultimately after getting to know me is that I ask questions not because I don't know the answer, but because I want to stir shit up, I want to agitate things and I want to start a conversation because without conversation and identifying these problems, getting you to say it, getting someone else to say it and identify the problem, then we don't have to go through all of the rigmarole or you trying to convince me that you don't know what the fuck I'm talking about. So I do inform with care because I don't do any of the shit that was done to me going through this process. Period. <laughs> <laughs> oh it was high i don't enough. know what nothing oh i don't know i don't really know how to answer that i mean i don't i don't know i'm more of a like what i mean i know i guess i think that um mostly i see that maybe it's because of our experiences and kind of the way that we were trained growing up um, mm -hmm. by society that like the stakes were b around this were a lot higher for me growing up. So it's, it, it feels, I have a higher sense of urgency with this stuff, you mm -hmm. know, because time's at a premium because I have access right now. I'm at the table right now, but I may not be tomorrow or a week from now or a month from now. You know, yeah. because <clears throat> people who look like me, once the novelty wears off, the novelty of a strong black professional voice <clears throat> wears off and there's no longer a convergence of interest. Like I always say, shit's cool until it's not. <laughs> the shelf life for people like me, it, it, it kind of dwindles and it's mm, gets a little gets a little tenuous. <laughs> it may expire <laughs> sooner rather than later. So I guess I guess what I mean is like. Where do you find the balance between? Because this is, this is, and I'll shut up and let you answer after this. This is where I'm at. So I was never really in my life outside of this, even given the space to receive a message that was delivered with kindness and grace and empathy and forward thinking um, and meeting me where I was at. It was like, nah, dummy, you need to figure this shit out because you fucked up. So it's going to be this or it's going to be that you got 10 minutes, like essentially, like not literally 10 minutes, but that is what it is. Here's the plea bargain. Here's the sentence. If you don't, if you don't take the plea bargain. Right. So I, I think that that kind of experience for me has kind of whittled down, um, I guess my, my level of patience or maybe narrowed that window. I don't, I don't feel like if I'm not, if I wasn't good enough, to be given that kind of grace and space, then as an oppressive person, a part or, or a part of an oppressive system operating with impunity for however knows long, whoever knows long, why then is this something that is a default mechanism of treatment for you when it's not for me? So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're no, like I, yeah i know i agree I mean, it's like that's where people get like white privilege messed up you know yeah. like they don't understand it and it's true because the things that you've had to fight for your whole life are things that i've never had to fight for i mm. mean and 
in the last 15 years, what I've learned, you know, from you, through you, um, and just to raise my awareness with the world around me has been like baffling at times because mm -hmm. it's just was so different than the life that I knew growing up, you know? Right. I mean, I was a little white girl in Whatcom County, you know, we all were. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's difficult um, to see some of the things that you got to go through and, um, and you're capable, 100% capable of, you know, battling yourself, you know, for yourself, but mm. it, it makes me mad and I want to like you're my tribe and you know like I'm a mama bear mm. and I want to protect you <laughs> but um but so still to and I appreciate that but to answer the the to we'll circle back to the question <laughs> where yeah. where do you find that that how do you where do you identify <clears throat> where's that boundary at where is it when is it time to like put on the kid gloves because like I, I tell you like the kid gloves, like I'm, I, I have them and I can use them, but most of the time I feel like rescuing and covering and excuse making doesn't help people. And how I know this doesn't help people, how my point is proven over and over again is because it, A, it was rarely offered to me and B, when it was offered to me, it felt gross. Like I would, I was able to identify it and be like, nah, that's some weirdo shit. What are you talking about? Yeah. I don't, I don't know. I mean, like I'm still learning. Like I, I don't have my, I don't know. I don't know the way that I approach people and, you know, especially in a professional space, like I'm quiet a lot. Yeah. You know, I, I'm still finding my voice and my confidence because I still feel, especially in, you know, what we're doing now, I still feel like I'm the student, you know, mm. and I know I have a lot that I can offer, but see, truthfully, I'm just, I'm quiet I, a lot. I would agree that there are circumstances, both you and I in this new space that we are students. So there are systems and mechanisms that we don't fully understand yet. There are relationships that we haven't established yet on the professional side. So that kind of stuff makes sense that there's going to be a learning curve. And the the reality is that you just don't know what you don't know. And I don't know, I do know that that doesn't have anything to do with capability, right? Mm -hmm. On the other side of that, conversely, the stuff that you do know, the stuff that I do know, well, I'm not, not claiming to know everything. The shit that we do know, we know. Yeah. We know. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, we went through, like, the fire. So there, and realistically, I've been on my own so long making a fucking mess of shit a lot of the time. But still, I feel like there ain't a lot of sh ain't a lot that people who haven't been through what I've been through can tell me about my experience. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Like, if you not live through a lot of this stuff, sure, you might be a director of this and you might be an expert on that. But all that tells me is that you're an expert on running a program. You're an expert on running a service. You're an expert on facilitating a training about me and my life. So when I say that, I intentionally say these things to provoke emotions in people that make them want to talk and have a conversation and, and, from there to encourage them to look past their degrees, to look past their textbooks, to look past the credentials. Because I'm telling you, the human experience does not live there. It does for them, right? Because it's the those those credentials are only important to them. That's how I feel about it. Yeah. Because when I was getting clean, we're gonna cut off in like a minute. But when I was getting clean, I didn't give a damn if who was helping me had a degree from university of Phoenix or a master's degree or a PhD from Harvard or Yale or anywhere. I didn't even give a damn if they had a certificate in welding. Yeah. No, <laughs> I'm just looking for some humanity, you know, and some assistance. 
I don't give a shit where you went to school, homie. None yeah. of that shit makes a difference to me. And what am I saying when I say that? The same thing that I always say, the same thing that I said during my dependency, same thing that I said since I've entered spaces and services as a professional. I respect the hard work and all that stuff that people put in. But when I look across the table from me, all I just see is another person. That's yeah. it. That's, I just see another person. I can't, I don't, I don't, I'm not going to bend the knee to a position or to a degree. Sorry, I'm going to treat you like a person. And if you act Absolutely. like a butthole, I'm going to treat you like a butthole.